Statehouse program funding provided by the South Dakota Bar Foundation, the educational and charitable arm of South Dakota lawyers and judges. Welcome to SDPB's coverage of the Governor's Budget Address. I'm Stephanie Rissler alongside Kara Hetland. In just a few minutes, Governor Dennis Dugard will deliver his budget recommendations to a joint assembly of the House of Representatives. Those recommendations will be for fiscal year 2017. Exactly, and lawmakers are just uh, being seated. Be sure and stay tuned all the way to the end as we will talk with lawmakers for their reaction from this uh, governor's speech and also get some of their priorities as well. Education, I know, Education. Kara, you had a chance to visit with some mm -hmm. folks on midday just prior to, to this coverage. Education is expected to take center stage. But what I'm hearing, and it sounds like from the interview, interviews you did on the radio just a few minutes ago, there may not be a lot of discussion in terms of the Blue Ribbon Task Force, what recommendations may come from that, correct? Not at, during this speech. Uh, we may hear more during the governor's state of the state address, but I think uh, some lawmakers are going to be the ones actually to introduce the legislation. The governor may introduce some legislation as well, but that's going to come later during the state of the state. What I'm hearing is that uh, a big chunk of this conversation is going to come uh, from Medicaid expansion uh, and how to deal with that, some additional revenue uh, resources that they have come upon. I uh, was told earlier today that, um, you know, we have some extra money uh, and what are we going to do with it? So uh, those are some of the things that the governor is going to talk about today. And the governor, this will be his sixth set of budget recommendations that he's delivering since he's been in office. It really has been his procedure to not, um, I guess, address the media right. as to what he will recommend. It's a surprise to us, as it is to you sitting at home or listening on the radio. To the lawmakers, it will be a surprise to them. There may be some discussion as to what's expected, but what those final dollars are and what the charts say, we all see it uh, as you see it at home when the governor outlines it here. One thing that, that they are talking about doing differently is the entire appropriations process. This year is that they're going to, typically they wait until they get March receipts and then they in 48 hours uh, put together the budget uh, and go through the budget bill. They're gonna uh, try and move that forward and uh, start the process a month earlier. So they're going to have several weeks to actually go through the general appropriations bill. Again, the budget that the governor uh, delivers, uh, his address today and the numbers that he gives to lawmakers will uh, is, is just kind of a, a guidepost. And so lawmakers fill in the details and those kinds of things uh, through the appropriations process. But one of the things that they are anticipating doing is, is uh, starting the process a little earlier. And right now we do have uh, the Lieutenant Governor who has taken the podium. If you're listening at home or wherever you are, feel free to follow us on Twitter. We're going to be taking um, pictures of the slides, uh, hashtag SDLEEDGE and hashtag SDBudget17. Uh, so feel free to follow along. If you're sitting at home watching on TV, of course you'll be able to see all the slides as they are outlined. We'll now go down to the floor of the House of Representatives to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much and be seated. In accordance with the South Dakota Constitution and law, the governor shall propose a budget in which expenditures or appropriations may not exceed anticipated revenue and existing funds available for expenditure or appropriations. Appropriations by you, the legislature, may not exceed anticipated revenue and existing funds available for expenditure or appropriation. According to South Dakota law, the governor today shall submit to you a budget and copies transmitted to all of you today and for consideration in the preceding session of the South Dakota legislature. Sergeant at Arms, would you please announce the governor of the state of South Dakota? Lieutenant Governor and members of the legislature, the Honorable Governor of the State of South Dakota, Dennis Stugart.
seated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and welcome. Today I offer my proposal for fiscal year 2017. In today's remarks, I'll review the state's economy, our revenues and expenses for the current year, and offer my proposals for next year. Happily, the climate today is much different than when I proposed the budget in January of 2011, when the nation was still reeling from recession. We worked together to bring our budget into structural balance, and many of you made very difficult choices on behalf of our state. Today, we're stronger than ever because of those choices, and I still appreciate your courage. In the years since, we have been good stewards of the dollars entrusted to us, and we've also posted healthy revenue gains since then. And this has given us unique opportunities. We've had one-time money to invest in debt repayment, state parks, railroads, and scholarships, to name just a few. Let's take a look at how the last several years have ended. Fiscal year 15 marked our fourth consecutive year-end surplus. As you can see, the surpluses have been rooted in both revenue improvements and expenditure savings. The red parts of each bar depict spending, which was less than appropriated levels. These have been fairly stable in the seven to $13 million range. Most reversions have been in our entitlement areas, predominantly Medicaid. The blue parts of each bar depict revenue received above expectations. Despite pressure to adopt revenue estimates above recommendations and historical trends, we've worked together to adopt conservative revenue estimates with a high probability of attainment. Because of that, fiscal year 15 ended about $10 million above our revised estimates. With these surpluses, we've improved our rainy day fund balances and invested in one-time opportunities. Let's see how these surpluses have affected our rainy day funds. This chart represents our rainy day fund balances. Look at the blue line and the left axis to see the value in dollars. And follow that blue line. In fiscal year 9, 10, and 11, rainy day funds remained unchanged at $107 million. Our reserves grew in fiscal year 12 and 13 to $159 million. We spent some of those reserves and ended fiscal year 14 with $149 million in reserves. And last June, we ended fiscal year 15 with reserves at $170.7 million. In total, we've added over $103 million to our rainy day funds, of which we've spent about $40 million for disasters and debt reduction. The red line and the right axis represents the percentage those reserves represent as compared to the general fund expenditures for that year or the appropriations for that year. In fiscal year 09, again following that red line, we had a little over 9% in reserves and that stayed the same through 10 and 11. Then in 12, we reached 11.7% re, uh, of reserves. Fscal year 13, 12.9% of reserves. Fiscal year 14, 11.5% of reserves. And we ended this last fiscal year at 12.4% of, uh, of our appropriations. Since then, we've managed our reserves at or above 10% in the last uh, five to six years, above the 10% target. Nationally, the average state rainy day fund balance is about 5.4% measured just this last spring. We've set a target of about 10% and we have $27.4 million above that. And this year, I'm going to be proposing we use that $27.4 million to repay more debt. Before discussing that in detail, though, let's examine some economic trends. The South Dakota Council of Economic Advisors regularly considers a multitude of assumptions and economic forecasts. Reviewing this information with experts from all corners of the state helps us provide the best forecast of tax revenues that will be available for the budget. Let's take a look. IHS Economics produces a U.S. economic forecast each month. That's a national forecast each month. The most recent forecast is for between 2.9% and 3% GDP growth for 2016 and 17. 
stronger growth than the U.S. economy has realized over the past several years. Now, when this forecast was reviewed in October with the South Dakota Council of Economic Advisors, it was judged to be too optimistic. In fact, the U.S. economy has not had a calendar year of real GDP growth above 2.5 percent since 2006, compared to other forecasts from economists at Wells Fargo and the Federal Reserve, IHS is on the optimistic side, and looking back, they've been consistently overly optimistic over the past few years. Thus, in consultation with the South Dakota Council of Economic Advisors, our Bureau of Finance and Management moderated the South Dakota economic forecast. The moderated forecast is closer to recent trends for employment and income growth, and that moderated forecast was used to develop the revenue projections I'm going to be presenting to you today. We expect continued economic growth, but at slow and steady rates over the next two years, not accelerating rates. Inflation is another important variable, as inflation has a direct impact on sales tax growth. Simply stated, higher inflation creates stronger growth in tax revenues. But lower inflation that we've seen recently begets more moderate growth in sales tax. Inflation is projected to be in the zero to 2.4% range over the next two years, which is lower than historical rates. We're also assuming, assuming no major economic disruptions from abroad. Although volatile foreign economies can have an impact on the U.S. economy and South Dakota, major disruptions are impossible to predict, and we're not assuming any will occur. In South Dakota, we've also had healthy housing and construction activity over the past year, and we, in, we anticipate that will continue in 2016 and 2017. Lastly, and I'll cover this in more detail in a later chart, we anticipate lower farm income in the next couple of years. Lower commodity prices are leading to lower net income than recent highs, and this means less spending in the ag sector and lower sales tax collections as a consequence. These next chart shows IHS Economics' most recent forecast for the national economy, so the U.S. economy is what we're looking at, using four key indicators. The gray bars show actual numbers. These are history, gray bars. The blue bars show the forecasts going into the future. The first chart, top left, shows the U.S. real gross domestic product in trillions of dollars. Real GDP is considered the most comprehensive measure of the U.S. economy. Real GDP was flat during the recession years. Since then, GDP growth has been around 2.5 percent, slower than the 3.0 percent rate seen before the recession. IHS economics forecast stronger growth in 2016 and 17, as I mentioned earlier, rates of 2.9 and 3 percent growth, respectively. Top right chart shows U.S. unemployment, excuse me, U.S. employment. The U.S. economy lost about 8.7 million jobs during the recession, and it was nearly seven years after the recession began that those jobs were recovered. The job growth forecast for 2016 and 17 for the nation is growth of 1.6 and 1.4 percent, respectively. The bottom left chart shows millions of U.S. housing starts. Although housing starts have grown, the nation has not yet recovered to levels seen before the recession but is forecast to do so, as you can see, nearing one and a half million units by 2017. The bottom right chart shows U.S. unemployment. The annual unemployment rate reached nearly 10% in 2009 in our nation. Since then, it has steadily dropped. The forecast for 2016 and 17 is to remain about 5% nationwide. Now we'll consider South Dakota-specific economic indicators, four of them employment, non-farm income, housing starts, and unemployment. As I mentioned, the South Dakota Council of Economic Advisors met with the Bureau of Finance and Management in October and reviewed the latest IHS economic forecasts for the South Dakota economy and deemed them too optimistic. So we're going to look at the moderated forecasts. These moderated forecasts were used to develop revenue forecasts for fiscal year 16 and 17. First, top left, South Dakota employment. 
During the recession, South Dakota realized job losses, as did the nation, but only at about half the rate of the U.S. economy. We recovered those jobs more quickly than the nation, and we continue to grow our employment. Most recently, in October 2015, our employment was growing 1.9% year over year. We anticipate growth of 1.4% in 2016 and in 2017, adding approximately 6,000 jobs per year. Next chart, top right, South Dakota non-farm income. Income growth was flat during the recession years, but has grown fairly steadily since. South Dakota non-farm income is forecast to grow 46 and 4.8% in 2016 and 17. Bottom left is South Dakota housing starts. Housing starts dropped dramatically even in South Dakota during the recession. In 2012 through 14, we rebounded to over 4,000 housing starts per year, and we forecast similar levels for 15, 16, and 17. Last chart, bottom right, is South Dakota unemployment. After levels of 5% or worse during 2009 and 10, our unemployment rate has improved and we project it around 3% steadily over the next few years. The bottom line, the moderated forecasts project continued slow and steady growth in South Dakota. We continue to be conservative in economic and revenue forecasts as we've done the past several years. Now this chart shows net farm income against sales tax collections on farm machinery. As you know, in South Dakota, many purchases by ag producers are exempt from sales tax, but sales and use tax does apply to farm machinery. The bars use the left scale to show South Dakota net farm income. Look at 2002 and 2006. See how the low income during those drought years. Look at 2008 and later. Income is strong with high crop prices and big harvests. In 2014, farm income dropped and is expected still lower in 2015. Harvests were good, but prices are lower. What does this mean to our budget? Well, the blue line and the scale on the right, excuse me, the red line and the scale on the right estimates farm machinery sales tax collections. Look at 2007 and later on that red line. Tax incentives and strong farm income fueled machinery purchases. And sales taxes shown here grew from 17.4 million in FY08 to nearly 44 million in FY14. And of course, this boosted our tax revenue during those years. Now we see fewer farm machinery purchases, which means less sales tax. In FY15, machinery sales taxes declined 23%, 23.5%. In FY16, year to date, it's down another 15%. So, of course, lower net farm income means less farm machinery sales tax. And this means our overall growth in total sales tax will be below average until farm income and equipment purchases level out. Let's now see how all those economic variables will affect revenue for the remainder of the current budget year and for next year. I've used this chart in the past to explain why we need to be careful as we forecast revenue. This chart compares ongoing, ongoing general fund revenue as originally adopted to actual revenues ultimately received. For example, the first line, FY 2006, the legislature in March of 2005 adopted a one billion, one million revenue estimate. Actual receipts were better at 1 billion, 13 million. In FY7 and 8, before the recession, the forecasts were still pretty close, with actual collections a little lower than originally forecast. Then in FY09 and 10, during the recession, adopted estimates were too high and actual collections were significantly lower. We had to use one time federal stimulus money to balance our budget. In FY11 through 14, we adopted more conservative estimates. In those years, actual collections exceeded the originally adopted estimates. Consequently, we had extra one-time money to spend in those years. For 2015, last year, we adopted original estimates that were above what BFM or LRC recommended, and actual collections came in lower, forcing a mid-year revision downward. 
Thankfully, we were able to reduce spending in some areas and still ended the year in the black. This year so far, actual revenue is above estimates and it appears we can increase our estimate for the current year by $8.4 million. This means we will have additional one-time money to invest for FY 2016. And this also helps provide a larger increase than we would otherwise be able to expect for 2017. Now let's look at the detail of our current fiscal year's updated revenue forecast. This is the current year. We're uh, almost midway through it. Sales and use tax is revised higher by 3.7 million as our collection started the year a little above projections. Lottery has been revised higher by 1.1 million. And this number includes instant online and video lottery receipts to the general fund. Video lottery is currently running 4.1% higher than a year ago. Contract use excise tax has been revised higher by $3.1 million. Strong collections to finish FY 2015 and sustained growth in FY 2016 reflects, reflects continued strength in South Dakota construction activity. The insurance company tax up 2.8 million as collections finish 2015 ahead and we anticipate that growth to continue in FY 2016 with increases in property casualty and health premiums. Unclaimed property revenues were revised 1 million higher due to higher receipts so far this fiscal year. And of course we get the vast majority of this money in November, so we know what the vast majority of that collection will be. And claim payments so far are running below last year's pace. Licenses, permits, and fees are up half a million as collections have been slightly ahead. Tobacco taxes revised higher. We had two strong months of collections at the beginning of the fiscal year. And the bank franchise tax has been revised lower, mainly due to credits paid in the current year with estimated quarterly payments higher than actual liability. Other ongoing receipts have been revised slightly lower also. So the revised total ongoing revenue is 1,441.5 million. That is 8.4 million higher than the originally adopted forecast. Remember that 8.4 million number because it will contribute to one-time spending opportunities this year. 8.4 million. Now let's look at next year, our FY 2017 projected revenue. This is the year beginning July 1. This shows the revised 2016 revenues, which we just reviewed in the last chart. So the 1,441 is the increase number. It includes the 8.4 increase. We're building off that. And then we're going to show the FY 27 forecast beginning July 1 and ending June 30 of 2017. Sales and use tax for FY 2017 is estimated at 904.9 million, an increase of 32.2 million over the revised. FY 2016 number. This is a growth rate of 3.7%. It's less than historical growth, but still assumes a steady economy. The lottery category, including video lottery, is forecast to grow 2.2 million in FY 2017. Contractors excise tax is forecast to grow 4.1 million in 2017, a 4.1% growth rate, indicating continued healthy construction activity in South Dakota. Insurance company tax is up $5.1 million, a 6.1% increase over the revised 2016 estimate due to anticipated premium increases in property casualty and health insurance. Unclaimed property we've do is down $7.4 million compared to 2016. And this is because we must be conservative with this source of revenue because of its unpredictability. We really don't know where this is going to come in until November of each year. We don't have algorithms to use. We can't tie it to economic forecasts. All we can do is look at history. And so what the 2017 estimate represents the lower end of actual collections from our two largest holders over the past three years. License permits and fees are up $2 million, mostly from growth in security fees anticipated for 2017. Tobacco taxes are estimated to be down by 0.4 million due to long-term decline in smoking that's expected to continue. Bank franchise tax is up 6 million for FY17. Remember, the 16 estimate was revised downward because of overpayments. We expect 17 to be uh, closer to normal. That 11.4 number is closer to normal. 
Other ongoing receipts up 7.1 million due to higher receipts from trust funds and also related to the corrections budget restructuring I'm gonna be talking about a little bit later. Uh, total ongoing revenue is projected at 1,492.6 million, up 51.1 million compared to the revised number, which itself was up 8.1. So add that 51.1 to 8.1, and it means the new ongoing revenue available in 2017 is $59 million. New ongoing revenue, $59 million. This chart compares ongoing revenue available to cover ongoing expenses for the past three budgets. Two years ago at this time, we had the luxury of a $6 million structural surplus that the legislature left on the bottom line. The then current year revised ongoing revenue growth was 33 million. To that, we added 40 million of ongoing revenue growth for the following budget year. That totaled 79 million of new ongoing revenue to budget for ongoing expenses. Then last year, we didn't have any money available on the bottom line, which is more typical, but we also had to decrease the then current year revenue projection by 11 million. Again, we, we adopted a revenue estimate that was beyond recommendations by either BFM or LRC. And so we had to decrease our revenue projection by $11 million. Combining this with budgeted year revenue growth of $60 million allowed just $49 million of ongoing revenue growth when we built the FY16 budget. Today we're able to increase our current year revenue growth by $8 million because we were more conservative when we adopted our revenue estimate last March. And we added to the budgeted year's ongoing revenue growth of 51 million, and again, this provides that 59 million of new ongoing revenue toward new FY 2017 expenses. So again, being conservative in revenue projections plays a very important role. By being conservative, this increase in revenue in the current year allows increased ongoing spending in the following year, in this case, fiscal year 2017. So let's shift gears now and talk about how I'm, how I'm proposing to utilize the $59 million we believe will be available to us next year. Let's look at expenses as an overview. In the past, I've recommended utilizing one-time dollars to reduce liabilities or ongoing expenses. And this year, my proposal uses one-time funds in FY 2016 to repay debt held by the Board of Regents and the technical institutes. By doing so, we can repurpose the avoided payments to freeze tuition at both the Board of Regents and the tech schools. Secondly, the formula we use for Medicaid would require a 2.1% increase for this year. It's based on a prospective inflation consideration, but I'm proposing to give an additional 0.6% and also to improve rates of specific providers. Next, the budget also proposes to eliminate dependence on volatile federal or other funds within several agencies listed here. Also, this year's share of the federal medical assistance percentage, FMAP, decreased from 48.38% to 45.89%, or 2.49%, almost 2.5%. This savings is going to total $22 million which helps augment new revenue growth of $59 million, making a total of $81 million in improvement. My budget proposal includes budget authority to expand Medicaid, if we can do so without any general fund cost. I'll discuss that in more detail in a few minutes. And finally, the Blue Ribbon Task Force has offered recommendations relating to teacher salaries and school funding and I look forward to working with the legislature to propose dedicated funding to address these issues. Now let's look at expenses in more detail. For the Board of Regents, I'm proposing a 2.5% increase plus an additional $2.9 million or 1.4% to freeze tuition. By using one-time funds, as I said, to repay Board of Regents bond debts, thus eliminating the bond payments they're making. For the technical schools, I'm proposing 2.7% increase. And, as with the Board of Regents, using one-time funds to repay technical institute debt so the avoided payments can be instead used to freeze tuition. 
Our formula would give Medicare providers an increase of 2.1%, and my proposal adds six tenths to that for a total of 2.7%, so all providers, 2.7%. And then my proposal would offer still more to providers whose, reimb excuse me, whose reimbursement rates are less than 90% of their allowed costs, and more about that in a minute. This would be the first of three steps over three years toward getting all provider reimbursement rates to at least 90% of their allowed costs. My proposal includes a 2.7% cost of living for state employees as well as movement toward their respective market value. And finally, the funding formula for state aid to K-12 education and special education would be a 0.3% increase. Any proposals made as a result of the task force will be on top of that. So what do those increases mean in dollar expenditures? For education, $21.7 million, or $0.8 million. This includes increases of 0.3% for state aid, as well as $8.6 million for the state aid to special education triannual rebase. And as I mentioned earlier, my proposal also includes increases of 2.7% for the tech institutes and additional funding for both the Board of Regents and tech institutes to freeze tuition. Again, this does not include any recommendation uh, from the Blue Ribbon Task Force. That would be in addition to this proposal. State employee compensation, 12.1 million. That would be a 2.7% market adjustment and specific increases for the career bands, along with a 2.5% movement toward market value. And we've seen favorable conditions in our state health plan, which I'll discuss in a moment. Medical services and provider assistance, nine million. The 2.7% uh, provider increase that I talked about a minute ago for all providers will cost $31 million, but that amount can be offset by $21.9 million in savings from the FMAP change for a net increase of $9 million. And again, this provides a 2.7% inflationary increase, and uh, it also includes funding for the second half of the Juvenile Justice Reinvestment Initiative. All the rest, $16.4 million, that would include uh, about almost half of that is the last step in our four steps toward a 2% maintenance and repair reserve. Uh, so we would finish that four-year program this year. It would also increase money for drug and DUI courts, and it would correct the funding dependencies in those six agencies I shown on the screen earlier. The total of 59.3 matches the new ongoing revenue we're projecting above the FY 2016 adopted revenues. Now more detail for each of these four lines. Look at education increases of 21 million. Here's more detail of that. State aid to education, special ed, that is, uh, $8.7 million or $8.8 .8 million. This is the triennial rebase, which is calculated on past statewide average expenditures increased for inflation. State aid to general education, $4.2 million. This includes the three-tenths of a percent inflation in general education. It takes the per-student allocation to $4,891.39 per pupil. Uh, this also includes an increase of 1.6 million as the limited English proficiency adjustment will no longer be covered by the Workforce Education Fund. The Board of Regents, maintenance and repair, $3.3 million. This is, as I said, the fourth and final year of the four-year plan we started to get our maintenance and repair budgets to a level which equates to 2% of the replacement value of our state buildings. This amount is the cost for the regental academic buildings. The Technical Institute's formula, $1.2 million. This increases funding for the Tech Institute's to $3,487.39 per student, assuming 5,905 FTE. It includes money to pay for National Guard tuition in the formula. Dual credit increased demand, 566,000. We've seen the dual credit program succeed well beyond our projections. We originally budgeted under 3,000 credit hours for the dual credit program last year, but based on this year's 
this, based on this program's success, we're budgeting 21,300 credit hours for next year's. As I've said before, this is a win for students, for high schools, for universities, and for tech schools and the state. And I'm very pleased to see its continued growth. This year, I'm proposing that we set the student share at one-third of the state cost so that it will increase gradually with tuition. That means next year the student would pay $48.33 per credit which is a significant savings over approximately $300 per credit hour if they wait until they're in the post-secondary schools to take those same hours. This bargain encourages higher utilization, which is beneficial to the post-secondary institutions and even more so to the students themselves. It makes these students more likely to attend a post-secondary school because they start with credits under their belt. It also makes these students more likely to find success because they can take an easier load as they're adjusting to the new school environment because they've already got some credits earned. And it also makes them likely then to continue and to graduate. And that's a problem we have in our post-secondary schools, getting kids to graduate. The next line, South Dakota Opportunity Scholarships, 434,000. Last year, you adopted my recommendation to increase the value of the Opportunity Scholarship, the first increase since the scholarship was created over 10 years ago. We're phasing that in over four years, so this would be the second year as a second new class enters college. This funding allows that second class of students to receive the increased $6,500 total award over four years. This funding helps keep the scholarship competitive, so it continues to be an incentive for students to take rigorous high school curriculum and stay in South Dakota for college. Over 3,900 recipients are projected for the coming school year. The next line item is the tuition freeze, $425,000. I mentioned using uh, one-time money to pay off debt, and after the savings generating by paying off the debt, We'll still need a little bit of money to add to the uh, formulas to uh, freeze the tuition for the Board of Regents and the Tech Institutes. The $425,000 will do it. Finally, miscellaneous increases and decreases, all that net out to be at $2.9 million, all add up to be the $21 million seen in the last chart total for education. I mentioned a couple of times, again, I want to restate it, I'm proposing to pay Regents and Technical Institute debt. This will free up ongoing funds that are currently used for those bond payments. And then that savings can allow those uh, Board of Regents schools and tech schools to freeze their tuition. And uh, let's look at that next. I'm recommending early repayment of four bond issues. The first column shows what these bonds financed. The first two issues funded Board of Regents Science Labs, and if these bonds look familiar, it's because two years ago, one-time funding was utilized to prepay half of those bonds that we were paying out of our general funds. This repays the other half that the tech schools, or in this case, the Board of Regents, are paying out of their budgets. The recommendation would pay the remaining bonds for those science labs, which the Board of Regents was paying with other funds. The third issue is a 2007 series bond associated with Western Dakota Tech and Southeast Tech. And the fourth issue is a 2014 series bond associated with Lake Area Tech, Mitchell Tech, and Southeast Tech. The second column shows the payoff amount for the bonds, the total of $42.3 million. And prepaying those bonds will save $3.7 million annually which again would be repurposed by those institutions to fund the tuition buy-down at Board of Regents and the Tech Institutes. We also save $14.6 million in future interests and fees, primarily from the first two bonds listed. Prepaying these will result in substantial interest and fee savings over the life of the bonds. As you can see, their yields are both over 4.7% in the far right column. The series 2014 bond payoff doesn't have any ongoing savings tied to it. However, it's beneficial to prepay this bond to prefund debt service. These four bonds, as I said, if they're prepaid, results in $3.7 million in ongoing, seven, uh, ongoing savings and $14.6 million in avoided interest and fees. 
Prepaying these debts allows us to keep college affordable by freezing tuition at our post-secondary institutions. The Board of Regents in-state resident tuition freeze for on-campus students for the 2016-17 school year costs $3.2 million. The Technical Institute tuition freeze costs a little over $900,000. The total cost of freezing tuition is $4.1 million. My proposal, as I said, will save about $3.7 million in ongoing a debt reduction payments. So we need to add an additional 429,000 of general funds to reach the total cost of the tuition freezes. Remember, although these dollars go into the budgets of the regents and the technical institutes, they don't create more funds for those institutions to spend. Those dollars go right into the pockets of our students in the form of lower tuition and fees than they would otherwise pay. I'm also proposing a change this year in how we budget for National Guard tuition incentives. I'm recommending that the Board of Regents abolish a fee called the University Support Fee and instead raise regular tuition rates by the same amount. That change will be cost neutral to most students, but it better leverages federal tuition reimbursement for National Guard students who will save about $141 per course. This will cost the Board of Regents an additional $315,000 annually, and I'm proposing that the state cover that cost. In addition, I'm proposing that the state general funds for National Guard tuition be moved into the National Guard, excuse me, from the National Guard budget and into the Regents and Technical Institute budgets so the institutions can more directly manage those costs in the future. Before I leave the topic of education funding, I'd like to speak for a moment about the Blue Ribbon Task Force. I'd like to start by thanking the task force members for the considerable time and thought they dedicated to that effort. It was an exhaustive process of public input, data collection, analysis, research, and policy discussion. And the final report is an excellent overview of the history of education funding in South Dakota, the current situation, and policy ideas for the future. I hope you have all read it. I have read it several times, and I recommend it to anyone who is interested in this issue. In response to the final report, I'm proposing, I'm developing proposals that I will discuss in detail at the State of the State Address. For today, though, I'd like to make a few points. I agree that South Dakota needs to increase teacher salaries to remain regionally competitive and to avoid a teacher shortage. I also agree that significant progress in this area will require new state funds. New state funds create an opportunity to fix long-standing inequities and inefficiencies in the current formula, and I agree with the task force that we should not lose that opportunity. The Blue Ribbon Task Force was not created to write a report that will occupy shelf space at the state archives. The public expects us to be bold and to make real progress this year, and I look forward to continuing that discussion in my State of the State and in the coming legislative session. Moving on, here are my recommended general fund increases for our state employee workforce. I'm, I'm proposing $9.2 million for market adjustments for permanent state employees and an additional $4.3 million to move employees closer to the market value of their jobs. I'll have more details on that in just a moment. I'm also recommending a decrease of $1.5 million in general funds for the employer paid portion of the state employee health insurance plan. Due to lower than anticipated claims, we can make this reduction and still keep our health insurance reserve at our fully funded level. This equates to a reduction of about $275 per benefited employee. Here are the details on my recommendations for our state employee salary policy. Last year, I directed the Bureau of Human Resources to implement a new market-based general pay structure for employees not in career bands. For those, I proposed a 2.7 market adjustment, 2.7% market adjustment based on regional salary surveys and inflation. Employees in the career bands will receive a market adjustment which is dependent upon the market adjustments in their profession. For information technology, accountants and auditors, 0% increase. For nursing, 1% increase. For environmental scientists, 2.5%, engineers, 2.7%.
Progress continues in developing a performance-based model for the general pay structure. However, this year I'm recommending a flat 2.5% movement toward market value for employees who are below the market value of their job. I'm also recommending pay for, pay for performance increases of zero to 4.5% for the career band families as we've done the past years, with some changes to allow higher performing employees to increase they, their base pay above market value and to move employees who are further behind market value ahead faster. Finally, I'm also proposing to bring all pay grades up to at least 85% of true market minimums. The jobs affected include building maintenance workers, secretaries, correctional officers, and mental health aides. Here are my proposals for FY 2017 for medical and provider assistance in dollars. Provider inflation in dollars is 16.9 million. This is the, this is the 2.7 percent inflation adjustment for all providers in 2016. Of course, this supports providers such as nursing homes, community support providers, physicians, many other provider types. Growth in utilization in FY17, we're projecting $6.8 million uh, growth in current Medicaid eligibles. In numbers, it's 1,708 individuals, which is a 1.4 percent growth of current enrollees. Also, the Juvenile Justice Reinvestment Initiative. Last year, I proposed implementation mid-year. January 1, we begin initiating the Juvenile Justice Reinvestment Initiative, so I needed funding for the last half of FY16, and you adopted that. This proposal adds a full year, adds a, another six months for FY17. That costs $3.3 million. I'm also proposing $1.3 million to fund year one of three years of rate improvements for providers who are being reimbursed below 90% of allowable costs. I mentioned this a minute ago. It'll cost $1.3 million this year to get those providers, some are getting as little as 60% of their allowable costs, get them a third of the way toward the 90% of costs mark. More about that in the next chart. FMAP, this year we're experiencing, as I said, a decrease in our federal medical assistance percentage or FMAP rate, a 2.49% decrease from 48.38% to 45.89%. This means state general funds will pay $45.89 of every $100 of Medicaid costs in 2017, FY 2017. Other miscellaneous increases and decreases net to $2.5 million. Those uh, include things through the Department of Social Services, Health, and Human Services. $1.3 million of this amount is specific to correctional health care costs. $800,000 is to fund the rural health care assistance programs in the base rather than annual one-time special appropriations. We've done that by special appropriations annually. Well, it's time to put it in the base. Note that none of, none of these proposals, I'll say it again, none of these proposals are connected to the expansion of Medicaid. Regardless of whether you agree that we should expand or whether the conditions are right to expand, each of these proposals is justified in any case. I mentioned I'd give you more detail on the provider rate analysis. This past summer, I asked the Department of Social Services, Department of Human Services, the Department of Corrections and the Bureau of Finance and Management to analyze provider rates. They analyzed 866 providers serving 48,900 individuals and compared the rates they were being paid under Medicaid to their latest cost reports, because each of them have to file cost reports with the state. They summarized their findings in a spreadsheet and three tiers were created according to the amount of allowable costs being covered by the rate we are paying. One tier of service categories is currently being re reimbursed at less than 85% of allowable costs. Some of those are being reimbursed at only 62% of costs. Another tier of service categories are currently being reimbursed at rates from 85 to 99% of their costs. And still another tier of service categories are currently being re reimbursed at 100% or greater. This chart shows these three tiers and the funding they would receive under my proposal. 
Of course, the first column is those three tiers. The 2.1% column shows the funding these providers would receive based on the provider inflation rate that's in our formula. The 0.6 column shows the additional 0.6 that everybody would get if you uh, agree with my proposal beyond what's statutorily required. The one-third to 90% is the funding for the first year of the three-year plan to get all providers to at least 90% of their allowable costs. And of course, the last column adds all the three elements to show the total general fund proposal of just over $7 million. As I mentioned earlier, none of this is connected to the expansion of Medicaid. Regardless of whether we expand, this adjustment to rates is based on data, and I recommend it. But now let's turn to that question. Let's turn to the question of Medicaid expansion. You know that I have been unwilling to support expansion of Medicaid in South Dakota in the past, primarily because of the cost to the state. Even though the federal government will pay 100% of the claims costs in the early years, states are required to assume 10% of these costs by calendar year 2021, and they'll be fully felt in fiscal year 2021 for us. Here are our updated, and these are updated estimates of the state general fund costs to expand Medicaid in South Dakota. In fiscal year 17, our claims and administrative costs would total $12 million. That goes up to $28 million in fiscal year 18, then $34 million in fiscal year 19, $46 million in fiscal year 20, and $57 million in fiscal year 21. At that point, the shift from 100% to 90% federal share would be complete. And at that point, the state would be paying the full 10%, and costs thereafter, unless the law is changed, would only grow with inflation. Remember the $57 million number. That's the far right side. That's the total cost of the state in fiscal year 21. Without a plan to cover these state general fund expenses, I have opposed expansion. I haven't said never. I've always said not now. We just didn't have the money. And for three years, we've had communications with federal officials about ways to make expansion work for South Dakota. Our early conversations were not fruitful. But in the past year, that has changed. It has changed because of conversations among the state, the federal government, and South Dakota tribes about the way we provide health care services and finance them for Native Americans. This has been a long-standing problem in South Dakota, and I'd like to go into a little more detail. The United States government has a treaty obligation to provide health care to Native Americans, and that obligation is supposed to be met by the Indian Health Service, regardless of the income of those Native Americans. When a Native American, though, who is Medicaid eligible seeks care, the Medicaid program covers that care, but if the service is provided through Indian Health Service, the federal government reimburses 100% of the cost of that care. I'll say that again. If a Native American who's Medicaid eligible seeks care, the Medicaid program covers that care, and if it's provided through Indian Health Services, Medicaid is reimbursed 100% from the federal government. In the most recently completed fiscal year, IHS spent $69.2 million providing health care to Native Americans who are also Medicaid eligible, 100% federally reimbursed. That's how it's supposed to work for all Native Americans. But it doesn't always happen that way. Many Native Americans in South Dakota are not able to be served by IHS. Maybe there's no IHS facility in their area. Maybe IHS doesn't have the right specialists available that, that's, that are needed. Or maybe there's long wait times and, and, and there's an emergency. No matter the reason, when a Native American who is Medicaid eligible does not get care through Indian Health Service, but instead goes to another provider, the cost is shared between the state and federal government at the normal FMAP rate. Last year, our Medicaid program spent $139 million on health care for Native Americans and at the normal FMAP rate. And $67 million of that money was state general funds. If we could save this $67 million, remember we only need 57 to cover costs in 2021. 
And 57 million is a very conservative estimate of our costs. And I look forward to describing how that was calculated with you. Keep in mind, Native Americans have a treaty obligation from the United States government for health care. And when South Dakota has to cover those costs, the federal government is not meeting that treaty obligation. If more Native American health care expenditures could be 100% federally funded, as treaty obligations require, the savings of state funds could be up to, as we, we saw, $67 million. And that's enough savings today to pay for the costs in 2021. Making this change would also free up more IHS funds so they would be able to provide better services to Native Americans at their facilities. In the past, the federal government has not been receptive to fixing the IHS reimbursement problem. Governor Janklow tried to get them to change it and couldn't. Governor Rounds sued in federal court over it and lost. But now the federal government is willing to listen. For the first time, we have the opportunity to solve this long-standing reimbursement problem. Earlier this year, a work group of individuals representing South Dakota tribes, legislators, the executive branch, and the healthcare industry began discussions with uh, the, the Federal Health and Human Services Department and with the Indian Health Service to work through these issues and to explore them. There have been several productive meetings and Health and Human Services is currently in the process of reviewing comments to guidance they issued last month. We're working, as I said, to save at least $57 million the cost to South Dakota in fiscal year 2021 when we must bear 10% of the expansion, expansion expense. But it is only possible if we expand Medicaid at the same time. Any change to our state Medicaid program is subject to approval by Health and Human Services and it also requires tribal consultation. Health and Human Services will not approve a change in how IHS reimburses our state unless we use the proceeds to fund expansion. This is a very complex area and making something work will be difficult. I cannot tell you today that everything will come together, but if it does, we should seize that opportunity, I believe. It offers the opportunity for better health care for Native Americans in South Dakota, and it will solve the long-standing IHS reimbursement problem. If we can find a way to transition enough of these expenditures to 100% federal reimbursement, we will have enough funds in our existing general funds budget to cover the state match required by 2021, not tomorrow, not FY17 or 18 or 19 or 20, but FY21, let me say that again, this solution is, at aimed, is aimed at solving the future need, not just next year or the next, but the need in state fiscal year 2021. So who benefits if we expand Medicaid? Who would benefit? Well, over 50,000 adults, and our calculations are assuming 55,000. We've added 10% to the number. Many of them cannot earn enough income to gain subsidized coverage. Tribal members, whether they're low income or not, because IHS will enhance quality and access to health care for a population who's badly underserved. In addition, this change would benefit counties because they will save much of the six to eight million dollars in poor relief expenditures they send to hospitals annually. It'll also help sheriffs with jails as well as state prisons because they will avoid the medical costs for indigent prisoners who are hospital, hospitalized beyond 24 hours. It will benefit hospitals who will be able to reduce their charity care expense. Now that expense is passed on to other patients like us. Hospitals would also see fewer uninsured adults seeking emergency room care. It would benefit all Medicaid providers nursing homes, community support providers, group homes, and others, because significant savings in Medicaid could allow us to improve reimbursement rates in the future. What if we can save more than 57 million? There's an opportunity to improve rates for other providers. Now, I know some of you are not excited about expanding Medicaid, and I still share some of your thoughts. It bothers me that some people who can work will become more dependent on government I hate that. I hate dependency. 
It bothers me that a single adult could choose to go on Medicaid rather than work a minimum wage job to qualify for insurance on the health insurance exchange. But we have to remember the single parent with three children. Between work and child care, a parent in that situation sometimes can't work enough hours to get insurance. They simply can't pay for it. They can't exceed the poverty line, and they can't get subsidized coverage. They just can't insure themselves at all. We have to remember that federal health care reform has created the absurd scenario in which a person at 101% of poverty can get highly subsidized insurance on the exchange, but a person at 99% of poverty can't and gets nothing. We also have to remember our Native American citizens whose forefathers were given a promise by our federal government. We should expect the federal government to meet that obligation. Now this is a complicated decision and we're gonna have to all weigh the positives and negatives. In my mind, the opportunity to end this long-standing IHS, IHS reimbursement issue to gain coverage for more South Dakotans, to improve the health care for Native Americans, to save money for counties and Medicaid providers, and potentially save millions in state dollars, I believe those things outweigh the negatives. So, my budget proposes $373 million of additional federal fund expenditure authority and 55 full-time equivalent employees to handle the new eligibles. No state general funds are proposed. I also want to be clear, this is not a done deal. Our talks with the federal government have been promising, but there is still work to be done, and there's still the potential for this to fall through. Expansion costs must be covered by our current general fund budget, or I will not support it. HHS and IHS must do what they need to do to make this work. Our tribes must agree with these changes and I will not support expansion unless you support it also. You can provide that support by passing a budget that includes this $373 million in federal fund expenditure authority. If you pass that budget item, it will give me the ability to submit a plan amendment to HHS to expand Medicaid if and only if all the other conditions are already met. This is the process we've always used to make changes in Medicaid, and it's the right approach to take now. Again, this is not a done deal. There are many moving parts, but I believe we should seize the opportunity if we can make it work. Moving on from Medicaid, returning to our proposals for ongoing expenses, these are my recommendations for changes in all other areas I haven't mentioned already. Maintenance and repair, $7.2 million, similar to the regental institutions, the Bureau of Administration is charged with taking care of our state-owned buildings, and this is the fourth year of the four-year plan to get us to 2% uh, of replacement value to, for all our buildings. So this would be our last year we'd see this line item. Department of Corrections, $5.5 million. They have federal and other fund cash across the department and income streams, primarily at the state penitentiary, where the population has required additional security measures. The funding change from cash to the general fund will structurally balance the entire department and make those expenditures more transparent. This 5.5 uh, general fund expense will be partially offset by an additional $4.6 million of other funds that will then be placed into the general fund as opposed to being held and spent as other funds. Correctional health, $1.6 million. This includes $970,000 almost a million dollars for treating inmates with hepatitis C, as well as contractual and inflationary increases. Drug and DUI courts, $934,000. They continue to be a successful alternative to incarceration and have helped to reduce recidivism. And this funding establishes a drug court in Brookings County and expands the drug courts in Minnehaha and Pennington counties. This increased funding will bring the number of drug and DUI courts in South Dakota to 14 courts. Miscellaneous increases and decreases, $1.2 million. Uh, those are a number of budget adjust adjustments across state government. I mentioned earlier a few other things in state government that I would like to address in this year's state budget. All of these items are located within the other categories I discussed earlier, but let me break a few of them out. 
Uh, special education rebase, $8.6 million. This is required every three years when we recalculate the cost to provide special education services to different categories of students, depending upon their severity of, of uh, education need. Corrections reductions, I just mentioned that, I, so I won't repeat it. Secretary of State, $848,000. I'm recommending a change to the Secretary of State's budget to allow the Secretary to retain a larger share of fees collected to fund the business and uniform commercial code activities internally with other funds, thus requiring less general funds in the Secretary of State's budget. This combined with a user fee package will pay for increased costs and a new online business filing system to streamline their operations while holding the general fund harmless. Department of Labor, $525,000. The Department of Labor continues to face decreases in federal grant awards while costs to provide this needed service increases. My budget structurally fixes this shortfall while also cutting some staff. Department of Veterans Affairs, $500,000. Uh, 500,000 of their other fund cash has been transferred to the general fund in this proposal. My proposal is to repeal that transfer in order to right size the budget at the state veterans home. The Attorney General, $390,000 funding for the Attorney General will be used to alleviate the structural shortfall within personal services been caused by increased overtime. As I mentioned before, I'm proposing using reserves and other one-time funds to repay debt. Also, FY16 revenues are higher than adopted and FY16 expenditures are projected to be less than budgeted levels. These and other sources will cover the debt repayment and provide for other one-time spending opportunities in the current year. Let me detail those. First, where did the money come from? Uh, first, a nominal surplus. The legislature left a $10,000 surplus on the bottom line in FY16. Uh, increased ongoing revenue in the current fiscal year are $8.4 million. You saw that earlier. I'm proposing cash transfers from the Department of Corrections, the Petroleum Release Compensation Fund, and the South Dakota Risk Pool, a total of $11.8 .8 million. I'm proposing $27.4 million from reserves, as I mentioned earlier. This, uh, this will still leave reserves at 10% of our general fund spending. A reduction, <coughs> excuse me, a reduction of annual appropriations. We've budgeted $12.6 million that I'm going to detail in the next chart that we do not need to spend this year, and we can instead spend it on one-time use. And then a total of one-time funds available in 2016 there, $60 million. Remember the $60 million number, but first let's go back to that last line item, the $12 million. Where did that come from? Reduction of some expenditure items. First, the state employee health insurance premium. We can reduce that premium in the current fiscal year. And by not spending those dollars, we can instead allocate them to a one-time expenditure. And as you saw, the FY17 budget proposes a lower level of premium expenditure. Um, so a decrease of $8.3 million in general funds for the state employee health insurance premium. Also state aid, a decrease of three point one million in general funds and state aid to general ed due to 277 fewer students than budgeted and higher property valuation growth than budgeted. And then finally, utility rate adjustments, decreases of $1.3 million in general funds due to recost, reduced costs and lower usage in utility budgets. Here are my proposals to spend that $60 million First, $42.3 million will be used to prepay bonds and repurpose the saved payments for tuition freezes, as I've already described. Uh, $2.4 million is to backfill the Extraordinary Litigation Fund for litigation expenses not covered by the Public Entity Pool for Liability, or the People Fund. That amount is $2.5 million, 2.4. Native American Student Achievement, $2.2 million is to improve the educational outcomes for Native American students based on the recommendations of the Native American Student Achievement Advisory Council. Their report was just issued. It should be available to you. Fire Suppression Fund to backfill $2.1 million for wildfires we've been fighting this past year. Need-Based Scholarship Endowment, $2.1 million. During the 2013 session, some of you will remember, the legislature established an endowment fund to ensure that needy students are not discouraged from per 
from pursuing a post-secondary degree, my proposal would add $2.1 million to the current endowment of $1.5 million. And in addition to this, I'm proposing that $1.4 million of Board of Regents other funds, which are available to their own one-time decrease in health insurance rates, go toward the endowment. So that would bring the endowment to $5 million between those three funds, the existing dollars, our 2.1, and the Board of Regents 1.4, total of $5 million. South Dakota Development Cent Developmental Center building demolition. This $1.8 million is for the demolition of three buildings on the South Dakota Developmental Center at Redfield. Demolishing these buildings is part of the Department of Human Services overall plan to reduce that footprint and reduce maintenance costs. A game Fish and Parks bond obligations, a million dollars. This amount is for Game Fish and Parks bond payments, a like amount of Game Fish and Parks other funds is transferred into the general fund, resulting in a zero impact. Railroad development, I'm proposing a million dollars for new loans for rail infrastructure projects to uh, have this million go into the Railroad Trust Fund. Medicare Part B premium, 954,000 for mandatory Medicare Part B premium payments. Correctional health care, 736,000 for significant inmate health care costs. The miscellaneous one-time expenses total $3.5 million. They include things like a new online business registration system for the Secretary of State, funding for shortfalls in the dual credit program and birth to three program in the current year, and tax refunds for the elderly and disabled. Some of these you've seen before. Then out of other non-general fund, I propose uh, three special appropriations. One you've seen every year, the water omnibus bill, I'm proposing $16,311,000,000 there for the Water and Environment Fund, the Water Pollution Control Revolving Subfund, and the Drinking Water Revolving Subfund for water and environmental purposes. Then I'm proposing $1,575,000 uh, $1, for the Animal Disease Research and Diagnostic Laboratory Design Study for the design study of a new lab at SDSU and then a million dollars for the Coordinated Natural Resource Conservation Fund, and we've, we've made an appropriation like that in the past, so that should be familiar to you. The total recommended budget is $4.4 billion, recommending over $4.8 billion in total spending in 2017. In addition, my proposal reduces full-time staff equivalent by 63 uh, in 2017 for a total of 13,940 FTE. Both years are honestly balanced without employing any of the borrowing or accounting gimmicks seen in some other states. As I mentioned before, the topics of Medicaid expansion and education reform may have significant budget implications, but are also important policy discussions that I look forward to this session. This is an exciting time for South Dakota. We've managed our state well, I believe and we have the opportunity to make great progress this year. I stand ready to join with the legislature as we develop solutions to these and other opportunities that face our great state. South Dakota is working. We're working better than many other states. We can proudly say we've balanced our budget honestly. Next year will be our 127th year. We've prudently set aside rainy day funds that allow us to address emergencies and seize opportunities that are available to us. We've made structurally balanced budget the norm. We've used one-time dollars prudently, ensuring they don't become an ongoing obligation. We've paid off even more debt. We have a state pension fund that's over 100% funded. That's a rare thing in today's world. We've memorialized financial practice improvements in statute. We've put those things in statute to help guide our, stu our state for the long term, even when we're not here anymore. These practices are all paying dividends. As you know, S&P upgraded South Dakota's issuer credit rating to AAA last May. And we've met with all three rating agencies and we're gonna continue to meet with them annually. And I'm confident that even more AAA designations will be coming to our state in these financial arenas. I look forward to continuing to work with you this year through your efforts, we're building an even stronger South Dakota. Thank you for your service to our state, and thank you for your time this afternoon.
Safe travels, everyone. A blessed Christmas, happy Hanukkah, and we'll see you next year. And that will wrap up Governor Dennis Dugard's address for fiscal year 2017, addressing a joint assembly of the House of Representatives. We are coming to you live from the state capitol building. Stay with us. We've got state lawmakers coming up to visit with me. We'll hear their reactions. Kara is actually on the floor of the House of Representatives. She'll visit with a few lawmakers down there. If you happen to miss any of today's speech, it will be archived at sdpb.org. There you can take a listen, take a look at it. And at your own convenience. And just remember, SDPB will return here on January 12th as the governor delivers the State of the State Address. So what all did the governor talk about? Well, he did talk about education. He talked about uh, Medicaid expansion, probably more Medicaid expansion than education. The Blue Ribbon Task Force was mentioned. It was straightforward. Issues and proposals coming for education will have to wait until the state of the state address. He did indicate that he agrees with some of the things that came from members of the Blue Ribbon Task Force, including that uh, there does need to be an increase to teacher pay. There needs to be a new way as to where that money will come from. So I guess we'll all have to wait until 2016 when the governor talks to all of us during the state of the state address to see what those proposals will be. Medicaid expansion, one of the things that the governor mentioned, he never said that it wouldn't happen. He just indicated that now wasn't the time for the conversation. Things have changed at the federal level. They've also changed uh, with the tribes, which has allowed the governor to talk about where we go with Medicaid expansion. There's been a long-standing issue with uh, some of the reimbursement rates when it comes with IHS, and it sounds like there's some give that will help the governor and the legislature move forward with some Medicaid expansion. If it uh, satisfies some of the lawmakers, we don't know. We're going to visit with some of those uh, lawmakers and kind of see where they stand in terms of what they heard today. But the governor did say if Medicaid expansion happens, it has to be put in the general uh, the general fund or he will not support it. So we'll, we'll have to see where everything falls into place. And it's not a done deal, even though discussions are going on uh, between the state, between the tribes and between the federal government. It's not a done deal. There's a lot of moving parts and where things fall into place by the time uh, this legislature wraps things up in March, we'll have to see. It sounds like uh, we've got some interviews that are getting ready to take place. Kara Hetland actually has uh, Representative Jacqueline Sly, who over uh, who ran the Blue Ribbon Task Force. Kara. Uh, Representative Sly, thanks for joining us. And were you expecting to hear something about the Blue Ribbon Task Force uh, today, or were you are you anxiously patient? How's that? Well, I believe that a lot of the budget is with money that's already established. And whereas the Blue Ribbon will be a conversation at looking at some other sources. And so it would be hard to put that into a budget address if you don't really know where it's going. Okay. So you, were, you weren't expecting a major announcement today? I was not because a lot of what we have included in the recommendations is policy, also looking at a change in the formula, but that isn't really a budget. There will be additional revenue requested or talked about or as we work through that. But I, I'm fine with him mentioning it, knowing that there'll be more in the state of the state. And as a representative, give me your uh, overall impressions of the budget address today and the, and the excess money, perhaps, that we have to spend? Sure. That's always good news. <laughs> we always look forward to having that because that means that we have some flexibility in looking at some maybe projects or different things that maybe haven't been funded before. And when you have that little bit, we have to be really cautious, though, with one-time dollars. It's only there one time. So we have to make really sound decisions about that, whereas ongoing funds then that's something that would be an ongoing expense. So oftentimes people think, oh wow, we have all this money. But we have to be really careful because if it's something that's ongoing, it's not very prudent to put it into uh, using one-time dollars. And your legislative priorities for coming up, uh, give, give me a little preview. Well, I would say that education because of the amount of time and energy that was put into that task force, that is definitely one of them. But I think the conversations will be much broader than that, too, because as many of 
us are aware, the counties are looking at uh, additional funds. I've heard municipalities are looking at additional dollars. Medicaid expansion is another one. So I think it's going to be a really robust uh, session, and I really look forward to what's ahead. All right, Representative Sly, thank you for coming down. Stephanie, back to you. All right, thank you, Kara. I'm now joined by Senator Bernie Hanha. First of all, Senator, your overall thoughts on what you heard. Well, overall, I think it was great transparency. I mean, the governor went on for 75 minutes and gave us a lot of really good detailed information. And, and for some of us who have been around for a long time, that's really appreciated because there are a lot of moving parts to a four point, what, four point eight billion dollar budget. And uh, there is people and programs and, uh, you know, important policies behind all those numbers. So I appreciated the transparency. I want to ask you about Medicaid expansion. He went into more detail. Uh, in a way where he may move forward with the discussion, but it's not a done deal, your thoughts? Well, it, as the governor indicated, it, 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 it's not a done deal because it's a really big deal. This would be probably the biggest uh, policy reform or improvement, I think maybe in my adult lifetime. I mean, this is a huge deal for South Dakota. The governor laid out all the benefits to it. I mean, we should have done it three years ago. We would have saved hundreds of lives. We would have invested something like a billion dollars in federal funds into the state's economy. It should have happened three years ago, but I mean, we've got it on the front burner today and um, we've got to make it happen. And I really appreciate the governor setting aside ideological concerns and really focusing on the benefits and on the dollars. And I think if we can all do that, if we can set aside the ideologies and just work to make this thing work for South Dakota, then we'll get it done. You've been uh, doing your part here in the legislature for many years. Any issues that you are going to have your eye on the coming session besides Medicaid or education? Well, along with Medicaid and education, I mean, we've, we're, first, first of all, I, I know you don't mean to say aside, but those are the two issues we've worked so hard on. And they've taken such a beating over these last several years that to have them on the front burner, I mean, a lot of us, a lot of us feel like, you know, uh, we've been playing in the minor leagues for a long time and now finally we've got the real issues on the front burner and it's going to be a very important session because if we can do something with education and with Medicaid expansion I mean it's going to transform the state. Those are the two big issues. So it sounds like those will be the issues that you'll be focused on. Well, and, and I hope the legislature doesn't get too distracted by lots of other issues because those uh, if we could accomplish those two things it would be a, a really big deal for South Dakota. All right, Senator Bernie Hanha from Yankton, thanks for joining me. Thank you. All right, Kara, we'll let you go from here. All right, and joining me now on the floor is uh, State Senator Billy Sutton. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, and no real surprises for you? Uh, not too much. I'm really happy to see uh, Medicaid expansion be discussed so much uh, in the budget. And uh, this has been an ongoing process. You know, this it didn't happen overnight. Uh, you know, our party and, and members of our caucus have been involved in this discussion for the last really three years, but more specifically about the IHS issue the last nine months. And it's a lot been a lot of hard work and a lot of discussion revolving around that, and I think we're getting pretty close. Um, HHS is, seems pretty open to this change, and so Medicaid expansion really relies on that change of the FMAP rate from 100%. And so uh, we're just looking forward to hopefully getting that done here in the next couple months and being able to move on out of this session with uh, full Medicaid expansion. Now give me, uh, help me understand a little bit what he's asking lawmakers to do because it's not a done deal, but what does he need your permission to do? He needs federal funding authority. So any time that we expend federal dollars, we have to pass an appropriation of authority um, to spend those dollars. So just because the feds give us money doesn't mean that you can go out and spend them. The legislature has to actually approve that through the budgeting process. So really all the governor needs is that authority. And then that change in FMAP rate will create enough savings, as he explained, that we would be able to use those savings to expand Medicaid. So really all he needs is the authority to spend those federal dollars to expand Medicaid. But that's the only way that money can be spent is on expansion, correct? Yeah, essentially. I mean... Uh, we can't, I mean, part of this agreement is that uh, if we change this rate, uh, the IHS rate, that then we expand Medicaid. That's the agreement. And so uh, we're required to do so. Otherwise, the HHS wouldn't sign off on the uh, Medicaid plan uh, amendment. Okay, so uh, Medicaid expansion, education reform, two of the really big issues for the Democratic Party and Democratic lawmakers 
Is there another uh, effort that the Democrats are going to put forward during the next legislative session? Uh, we'll be having some discussions about, um, you know, what happened with the Gear Up program, things like that, talking potentially about a ethics commission. I mean, that is a, a topic that's at the top of our agenda. Uh, another thing that we were, you know, was one of our focuses that we're glad to see in this budget is uh, the tuition freeze. You know, that's a big deal. Uh, anytime we can freeze tuition and try to make uh, the cost of going to, to higher education a little bit cheaper for our students in South Dakota is a good thing. But still very much a conservative approach uh, to the monies, and to the revenues in the state of South Dakota. Yeah, and that shouldn't surprise anybody too much. You know, uh, Governor Dugard has taken a really uh, conservative stance since day one. And so uh, it wasn't that surprising to see that. Um, you know, so, so I don't think anybody was, was uh, you know, knocked off their chair or anything with, with what he was talking about. But uh, I think there were some people that, you know, are maybe surprised about the Medicaid expansion discussion. And uh, from our standpoint, that's something that we believe we should have done uh, from day one. But we're having the conversation now. It's amazing what can happen when people get around the table and have real discussions and, uh, you know, find real solutions. All right, Senator Sutton, thank you so much for being with us today. Stephanie, back to you. Thanks, Kara. I'm now joined by Senator Troy Heiner. Medicaid expansion, education seem to be the, the hot issues that lawmakers are talking today. No doubt they will be the big issues going into the session. You representing Indian country, a lot of folks will be impacted, are impacted by the Medicaid expansion issue. Tell me what, you th what your thoughts are as to what you heard today and the direction the governor maybe will go if this does go through. Well, thanks for having me on, Stephanie. I, yeah, I was pleased uh, with the governor's uh, reaction and his comments about Medicaid expansion. I think it's, it's a lot more movement than we've seen in the past. Um, you know, I, I sat on that work group and I know what Medicaid expansion is going to do for, for us in Indian country and as well as our, at our IHS facilities. Uh, because we are so underfunded right now and, and we have to do something. Our people really need it. One of the things he said at the end is the money has to be allocated through the general fund, the general fund bill or he will not sign it. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I think, of course, I've, I've supported it since it first came around. Um, I think he could sign it at any time. I, I think he, he's going to need to show the legislature uh, that it's going gonna, it's gonna to be general fund neutral with the money that we're going to save changing that FMAP rate. Uh, and I think hopefully the legislature can get behind it and, and support him. In addition to Medicaid, tell me your thoughts overall on everything that you heard today come from the governor. Well, you know, of course, it is what it is. I mean, that's that's the money we have. That's the money we're projecting. I, I think we've always been a, maybe a little bit too conservative because because I've had to look people in the eye and say, sorry, I can't, you know, we can't get this funded. And then, you know, a month or so later, we have uh, some money left in res and we put it towards reserves. Uh, I think we could we could probably narrow that in a little more because uh, there's some very worthwhile programs that, that we don't get funded right now. Um, you know, the big elephant in the room is uh, uh, the Blue Ribbon Task Force and what's that going to look like. Um, you know, nobody really knows uh, what the governor's plan. I, I sat on that work group as well. Uh, I know the recommendations that we had sent. Uh, and we weren't all happy uh, coming out of there. Uh, that wasn't, we didn't have full consensus there. So we'll see what the governor's plan is. We'll have to make our decision and, and look and, and see if we uh, submit another plan or or what we can support and, and what needs changed. All right, Senator Troy Heiner, thanks for coming to visit with us. We'll see you back here in January. All right, I know we're getting very close to uh, wrapping things up. I do have one more interview, and I want to bring in Representative Peggy Gibson. Representative, we are live here. It's always kind of you to come up here and join us. Your overall thoughts on what you heard today. Thank you, Stephanie. I made some notes while the governor was speaking here. Um, about his proposed budget and and I'll start off with some positive comments first um, I'm glad he's freeing up some rainy day funds finally and um, do, using this for debt reduction and helping our students and reduce their student loan debt um, I was very happy about the opportunity scholarship and the needs-based scholarship situation um, I know the Blue Ribbon Task Force will be talked about 
uh, at a later date, but we are, as Democrats, planning on uh, having, some, having an alternate plan or a plan that, that we hope will have some consensus about really helping our teachers and how much, how much new money we really need. Um, the dual credit opportunities are wonderful. I have students in my school district right now using those and taking advantage of those. Um, the National Guard tuition was very positive. Um, so I'm really happy, uh, and our, uh, the, the status of our pension plan was, was absolutely wonderful. Um, my mother passed away, the pension plan uh, went to my father. My father just passed away, but that was very helpful in their retirement years. And to have that be solid was, was wonderful. And then I, some other comments that I had about uh, Medicaid. Um, one life is lost out of 176 people if they're not given adequate access to medical care. And that's from the New England Journal of Medicine. So in the last three years, by not expanding Medicaid, we have seen at least 300 South Dakotans die. So by not expanding Medicaid for the last three years, there's been an actual death impact in our state for South Dakotans. Plus, I feel that we would have had a billion dollars injected into the state's economy. That would have turned over about seven times, and I think our economy would have grown even more. So the 2011 regressive cuts, which were so unnecessary and so, so harsh, are really catching up with us now. And we still aren't at a level where we, can, we have totally recovered from those cuts that I feel were not necessary. I am glad that the government or the governor is seeing fit to uh, consider expanding Medicaid to 55,000 working South Dakotans. These are not pawns. These are people who are actually out there working, but they just don't, they, they make a little bit too much to be covered by Medicaid right now. So I think you can be conservative to a fault. But um, I'm looking forward to doing some positive things for the state of South Dakota, freeing up some of that rainy day money and distributing our tax dollars as I see them uh, to be fit. All right. Always good to visit with you, Representative you Gibson. Too, Sorry to hear Thank about you. your father. Thank you so much. All and right. always good to be here. And I love South Dakota public broadcasting. Well, thank you. Safe travels back to Huron. Thank you. And that does conclude our live coverage of the governor's budget address. Again, this will be for fiscal year 2017. If you missed any of it, the whole thing will be archived at sdpb.org. Watch it at your convenience. And we'll be back here in January as the governor kicks off the 2016 legislative session, the state of the state, on January 12th. Until then, on behalf of all of us with South Dakota Public Broadcasting, I'm Stephanie Rissler. Thanks for tuning in. Goodbye. Statehouse program funding provided by the South Dakota Bar Foundation, the educational and charitable arm of South Dakota lawyers and judges. Get complete coverage of the governor's budget address from SDPB. See our veteran Statehouse team's report rebroadcast tonight at